Why are we so exhausted and how can we find solutions? That's the topic we're going to address today on Flourishment. I'm your host, Tina Yeager. Today, I have a very special guest on Flourishment. Today, I have Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith. She is an award-winning, best-selling author, a physician, a sought-after speaker, and she has written a book called Sacred Rest, which is why she's here today. She's also the host of I Choose My my Best Life podcast, where she shares biblical insight to help others live fully, love boldly, and rest intentionally. We're here to talk about why rest is God's best in this second half of our conversation with Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith. I want to get into some practical ways that we can begin to restore. But first, my first question is, are there some people who have a harder time in each of these areas than others. When you mentioned in our first half of our conversation that sensory deficit of rest being a specific one, my mind as a therapist automatically went to sensory integration disorder where some people really struggle with that. Is that true for all the areas of rest where certain people will find that they struggle more in certain areas than others? I believe so. There's, I oftentimes will get information from people who are uh, neurodivergent or have other specifics within their, themselves as far as how they relate to different types of rest. And so it can vary. So there automatically are some specifics per person just because of their own background, their lifestyle, the way they use different things from at work and at home that will predispose rather some people to have rest deficit in certain areas. But what I find often is if someone has like an underlying either medical or psychological or physical condition that predisposes them to a specific rest deficit, they tend to already be working on that area because they are they've all they've already noticed the dysfunction, so to speak, that happens within them when that area gets off balance. So typically that's an area that most people have already thought about. Like, for example, people who are autistic will often say, well, I, I knew there was some type of sensory thing that I was noticing when I got in certain situations. They may not have known the details behind it or even really associated it with something as rest and restoration, but they knew that there was something that was occurring in these situations. They could tell that their body was responding negatively in some way. So we're tending to have rest deficits in the areas where we think we're fine. Is that what you're saying? No, some people actually are fine in some areas. So I usually put it this way. If you find yourself, if you go to bed and you sleep eight hours, nine hours, whatever your normal time frame is, and you wake up the next morning and you feel tired, that's when you stop and you ask the question, why am I not feeling better? Because technically, you should wake up every morning feeling energized, ready to start your day, excited for your day. There should be some level of, I feel prepared to enter into this day. And if you're not feeling that, something is not right. Now, as a physician, I always say we should probably start just to make sure there isn't some underlying medical issue, right? You don't have sleep apnea. You don't have diabetes. You don't have something else, you know, that's actually underlying it, that's causing it. And so if all of those things come back negative, you know, there's nothing physically or, you know, medically wrong with you, then it's a matter of, are there rest deficits? Are there places in my self that are not getting restored? And so the way I started this with my own health journey was looking at what are ways that I'm using energy throughout the day? I think that's a good place for most of us to start. So just look at your day and what kind of energy do I use? I think often we're not even aware of how we use energy. You know, you may be spending all day working with clients as a counselor and you're thinking, well, I'm sitting in a chair. I'm not necessarily, you know, using a lot of physical energy, but you're probably using a lot of social energy because you're having to engage with these people. So they are pulling from your social energy. They are not life-giving necessarily to you. They are pulling from your social energy because you are life-giving to them. And so then you have to evaluate, are there relationships in my life where they are life-giving, where the person in front of me is not needing anything from me? They are not pulling from my social energy and start looking at who are the people in my life who don't need anything from me? 
who are the people that I can just hang out with and have fun and there's no expectation. There's no pull on me socially. It's just a relationship where I get fed and it's celebrated and enjoy because a lot of us don't have that. And that sometimes is the rest that we're needing, the, re the rest of life-giving relationships, because everybody in our life are people who's pulling from us. It's our kids, it's our family, it's our spouse. And if no one is actually in our life that is actually on purpose pouring back into us. So that's sometimes the issue. And then, you know, the other things, like if we're using the counselor as an example, another thing could be you're sitting in front of a client who's giving you you know, a horrific life story of what happened to them, telling all the details and all of that. And if you're an empath, you may start feeling some of those emotions. You're sad for them. Uh, an example I often use as a physician, oftentimes when I'm at the bedside of a patient who's dying, these aren't strangers to me. This is oftentimes patients I've been treating for years. So I know the dog's name. I know the spouse. You know, I know everybody in the family. And so as someone who has a tendency to have a very soft heart, I may want to cry in that moment because my friend's on that table dying, but you'll never see a teardrop because I know it doesn't serve the patient, the family, my nursing staff. So I keep all of those emotions in check, but I need moments in my life of emotional rest when I can release that in a safe place where it's not disrespecting the patient or the family or my staff. And I can tend to my own emotional health by releasing that somewhere. And so I think we need to realize that every job has ways that it can develop a rest deficit. And then if we're not intentional, we can get into toxic uh, situations where they never receive the rest and restoration that's needed. This is so fascinating. And I'm learning so much that I thought I knew what it meant to rest, but this is all new and wonderful and very important information for everyone to know. So can you tell us just a few of the ways that we can look forward to finding solutions for these rest deficits? Yeah, so um, I'll start with some of the ones we talked about. So, you know, we talked about sensory rest. So if you're someone who finds that you do have a lot of noise or lights and sounds and all the things in your background, a couple of ways you can improve that. Um, using noise cancellation earphones, not necessarily trying to listen to something, but actually to block out the noise. So you're sitting at your desk, you're doing work, you hear, you know, the elevators going off down the hall, popping in the earphones for maybe 30 minutes just to have a moment of sensory deprivation. If you're a mom working from home and the kids are nonstop talking, putting the noise cancellation earphones on where you actually can still see your kids, you know, no one's killing each other but you actually don't have to hear them the entire time that they're playing or doing whatever they're doing. Um, another thing would be if you're someone who has a mental rest deficit and you lay down at night and your brain just kind of keeps regurgitating all the information and ruminating over it, having a notepad or journal at the bedside where you can do what we call a brain dump, where you jot down whatever that is your brain's regurgitating, whether it's a to-do list or something not to forget the next day. By jotting it down, you then give your brain permission to release it because it's not having to keep regurgitating it to try to keep it in there. Physical rest, if your physical rest has two forms, it has the passive, which we talked about sleeping and napping, but it also has an active form, which includes things like stretching or massage therapy or going for a leisure walk or something like that. So if you're someone who maybe you find that your body gets real tight while you're at work all day, part of a physical rest strategy would be having some breaks where you stand up or maybe having a standing desk where you do part of your work standing and part sitting. If you're someone who has a problem with creative rest deficits, you spend a lot of time processing and uh, thinking outside of the box and solving problems, finding the things in your life, the beauty in your life that actually inspires your creative part. So what in, kind of sparks your internal creativity, that childlike awe and wonder? For a lot of people, it's nature scenes. So the oceans, the mountains, the trees. For other people, it could be artwork. Um, for other people, it could be music or dance or theater. But figuring out what it is that actually sparks creativity inside of you, that awakens that part of you. And then finding ways of bringing that into your day, whether that's having screens on your computer, lock screens on your computer or your phone, where you images that are inspirational to you pop up. 
or even having like a theme in your house. Maybe it's a nautical theme in your office space, an accent wall, a splash of color that's inspirational to you. But recognizing that there are ways to layer in restorative practices where you're not always having to think about, oh, I need to set aside 30 minutes to get this type of rest. Some of these things are things that you can make habitual. You bring into a part of your life and you make adjustments so that you have some intentionality in what's surrounding you so that you can be restored on a continuous basis. This is such great information. I want you to take just a moment to address to all those who are in any kind of ministry, whether it's volunteer or staff ministry, about why it is God's will that we rest because people in ministry tend to be the ones that are least likely to take the rest that they need. They're constantly 24 seven, go, 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 go processing, trying to do something for somebody else. I don't know if you found that to be true in the people that you work with, the people that are in ministry and we are in ministry actually in a way. So can you talk about that just a little bit about why this is part of being obedient to God's design? Yeah, it's it's really interesting that um, you know the entire book comes from the, from scripture and it starts all the way back to Genesis, the very first time rest is even mentioned. And I think what sometimes happens is because we the work that you're doing when you're in ministry is work that is specifically to build up the kingdom of God, to to edify and to empower the people of God. We think we get a pass on doing things God's way. It's like, well, I'm, I'm doing it for you, so I don't have to do it the way you said, right? I mean, that's how we approach rest. I mean, from the very beginning, rest has been a precept. If we look even in the current um, Hebrew culture, you know, it's one of those things where it's still practiced. The Sabbath is still practiced every single Saturday. Now, I don't tell people they have to practice Sabbath on any specific day, but what I do tell people is when we look at the reason behind Sabbath, it's the very same reason why rest was introduced in the first place. We hear that on the sixth day, man was created, you know, God spoken to mankind, commissioned them, all those things. And then on the seventh day, God rested. Well, when I was doing the study for uh, the work for this book, one of the things that kept popping up in my mind was, what was man doing on the seventh day? Because if you read that scripture, it doesn't say any work was actually done till after that day of rest. And so it was then that I started to kind of get a clear understanding of why there. this is such a battle spiritually for most of us. Our, the world teaches us that if we work enough, then we will earn the right to rest. When the work is done, now it's a time to rest. However, the biblical precept of rest is completely the opposite of that. God created mankind, spoke into mankind, told them who they are, have dominion, multiply, all of the things. But before mankind was actually ever sent out to do the work, mankind's first full day on the earth was the day of rest. Mankind wasn't there when the sixth day started. They were Their first full day was that seventh day. And I think we need to kind of reshape our thinking to that process, that each day of rest is actually where we are to begin. We're not to be working to earn our rest, but we should actually be working from this place of rest. That is in these places of rest with God is where we are empowered by his spirit to then go out and do what he's told us our commissioning is to go do. We're not doing it in our own power, which is what burns us out, makes us angry, makes us people who other people don't want to be around. We've all heard the stories of the angry Christian. Well, if you get exhausted, just like I said, the sensory overload, irritation, agitation, rage, and anger, rest solves that. Your fruit is sweeter when you are not someone who's burned out. Burned out Christians have fruit that is very sour. And so I think we need to realize that when you can't, when you don't have joy, when peace is hard to find, when you are battling within yourself because your own behaviors and actions don't reflect the fruit of the spirit that you know are possible, it's not always that you don't have a relationship with God. It's that you're actually not honoring the relationship he wants to have with you. One where you trust him enough to stop and rest. Hmm, this is so good. This is really about the principle of living in God's grace and love instead of trying to earn it in a sense. So I, I could talk to you about this for hours, but unfortunately we've run out of time. I know, however, 
You have a wealth of information, a wonderful book. So if people want to know more, how can they get in touch with you and get all the great resources that you can continue to provide for them to find God's best in rest for their lives? Yes, my main website is ichoosemybestlife.com. And from there, they can learn about all the different resources we have, including they can get access directly from there to Rest Quiz, where they can take the assessment to see which of the seven types of rest they need most. And it also has the information about how to get a copy of the book, Sacred Rest. Thank you, Sandra, and thank all of you for listening. I know that you were inspired and enlightened on this show. I hope that you will go to Dr. Sandra Dalton Smith's website and get a copy of Sacred Rest and access the resources that she has there. And of course, I also hope that you will hit subscribe and come back for the next episode of Flourishment. <music>